Now, I know I've already made a video attacking ANCAPs, but what can I say? ANCAPs are easy targets. I'll at least give them credit that ANCAPs seem to focus less on identity politics and more on economics, but to be honest, that's pretty much why I uh, find it easier to attack their ideas anyway, because I just don't really care about it, Paul, but yeah. Ah, Marxists attempting to criticize capitalism. At this point, it's hardly even fun anymore. Their arguments always come down to one of a few things. Once you've heard one of their arguments, you've heard it all. Oh hi, I'm the Heretic, and today we're replying to a video by Zex 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 this guy about how ANCAPs don't understand anarcho-capitalism. I mean, that's a very extraordinary claim to make, so you better have some good evidence. So for the sake of clarity, let's define my terms. Capitalism is the exchange of property. That's it! Property being dominion over a good, acquired through or trading for one's labor. Profit is when revenue minus expense is a positive. There. See? Not complicated. This is not a criticism of communism or even socialism. Don't misunderstand me. I'm criticizing Marxism specifically. You'll see right here, zig 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 this dude will demonstrate the repetitiveness of the arguments. Hit it! So I want to talk today about how it seems that ANCAPs don't even understand the main two factors that perpetuate their own ideology. First, the state, and secondly, welfare. Let's watch him redefine capitalism and explain how a coercive monopoly stealing from people and forcing their will on them perpetuates the voluntary exchange of property for some reason. Then again, that's even if we can see them define their terms. Now, I want to say I don't actually support either of these things. Welfare, because it's uh, used by the capitalist to perpetuate capitalism for the reasons it's about to go through. Actually, I'd rather you go through them right now. And I think we should smash the state and replace it with a worker-controlled one instead, which would over time wither away. How many years would the Soviet Union have had to continue before they achieved anarchism? What I'm trying to get across in this video is that ANCAPs don't realize that capitalism relies on these things, and that if they were to be done away with, uh, they would most likely just be replaced in some other way, or you know, the workers would rise up and lead us to glorious socialism, or maybe some form of fascism, accelerationism gets pretty volatile, but anyway, let's, let's get into this. Then you should support capitalism to accelerate the shift to glorious socialism, but can you hurry up and explain how a violent coercive monopoly, the state, and vote buying through welfare perpetuates I exchange of property? Please forgive me for needing to define your terms for you, since you haven't. So let's talk about the state first. ANCAPs believe that the state is only there to regulate and hinder corporations under capitalism, or lead to monopolies and mega corporations, gi uh, giving us cronyism, which is what we have today, rather than true capitalism. No, that is not what anarcho capitalists understand. Government does regulate, which incentivizes crony capitalism as regulatory capture allows corporations to raise barriers to entry in their industry, which reduces competition, which does lead to megacorporations. Who do you think is going to be more inconvenienced by zoning laws, an ISP startup or Comcast? If you want to make a point about ANCAPs having a contradictory belief system, that's one thing, but this isn't even pretending to understand what they believe. Now, leftists, on the other hand, believe that the state is an inherent part of capitalism and is required for capitalism to remain functional. This is a general statement, not an argument. The state as we know it today has never actually been a thing before the birth of capitalism. And since the birth of capitalism, it's been growing alongside with it, being formed and shaped by it, and so is capitalism. If we're going to make the claim that you just did, that is an extraordinary claim. Citation needed. Capitalism and the state have always been entwined, you know, since the centuries ago that was created, and in a sense are dependent on each other. It's a good idea to have these states on hand to make yourself sound more credible. Also, I would need to know who invented capitalism or even how it could be invented. If you're going to say Adam Smith invented capitalism, all he did was comment on market forces already present. The interests of the ruling class, who are a minority, will never align with the interests of the working class, who are the majority, as everyone in capitalism wants to be on top. Of course, though, basic logic dictates that you can't have everyone on top, because then everyone's the same, so it doesn't really work. If you can't have everyone on the top, then you can't make everyone equal, too, since equality will necessarily have to become the new top. By your own arguments, 
economic parity is impossible. But anyway, it's because of this that the state is perpetually required to oppress the working class to essentially keep them in their place. It's because of this that the state is required to perpetually oppress the working class by one, keeping them where they are for our generations, and two, making sure they continue to serve their capitalist overlords. You need to explain how the state oppresses the poor so they work for capitalist overlords. Otherwise, I can dismiss your point as a non-argument. The state is made up of the ruling class and serves the ruling class. There is no form of capitalism that doesn't have a ruling class, because as I said, then you wouldn't have classes. But if we don't have classes, that means your entire argument falls apart, as that means there can't be a capitalist ruling class. So far you haven't proven the existence of classes, as you're just assuming we accept the premise. I don't understand the title of this video, as this guy has yet to make an argument, like, at all. If you do remove the state under capitalism, one of two things is going to happen. Firstly, the working class, now no longer oppressed, will rise up and overthrow their capitalists, uh, realizing that they don't need a CEO to run their own workplace. Or, what's more likely to happen, the ruling class- Firstly, you assume there is only one mode of production under capitalism, the top-down hierarchy. And second, there's a horrible misunderstanding which has confused us all from the very beginning. What Marxists want, generally, is the worker ownership of the means of production, and have aligned themselves in opposition to capitalism. Marx contrasted them in terms of Hegelian dialectics, socialism, the thesis, and capitalism, the antithesis, two opposite and opposing forces. Hegelian dialectics, in a nutshell, argues that history is a recurring conflict of theses and their opposing antithesis clashing in a manner that transforms them both. Never mind the fact that dialectics are a discredited pseudoscience and Marx's prediction have been completely wrong. The need for an opposing antithesis has caused Marxists to redefine capitalism according to how it isn't socialism. If socialists want co-ops, then capitalists must want traditional firms only. If socialists want direct democracy, capitalists must want autocracy. If socialists want worker supremacy, Capitalists must want rich supremacy. Marxists argue against an economic system literally nobody advocates for. There's no reason worker co-ops can't exist in a capitalist economy. Now I did mention that Marx made several predictions that didn't come true, so let's elaborate. First, Marx thought that there would be fewer rich people. There are more. He thought the middle class would be destroyed and subsumed into the working class. It hasn't. And he thought the poor would get poorer. The poor nowadays, even those in poverty, enjoy lifestyles vastly superior to the rich of Karl Marx's day. So no, dialectics can't predict the future. As for if CEOs are necessary, well the truth is they, they really aren't. If, that is, if your company has no use for operations, marketing, strategy, financing, modeling company culture, human resources, hiring, firing regulations compliance, sales, PR, assembly of senior management. But other than that, you're right. Your company probably doesn't need a CEO. But what do I know? I could be wrong. Or what's more likely to happen, the ruling class will use private police forces, private armies, and private media platforms to spread their propaganda so that one mega corporation or several uh, cooperating uh, corporations can form their own kind of corporate state that does everything the state does today in terms of oppressing the working class. So we back to having a state. Except that a business and a government have mutually exclusive properties. A government takes your money whether you want to or not, whereas a business can only get money if you give it to them. So whether or not they could get a private army is entirely dependent on whether their customers want them to. My overall point is that you can't really have capitalism without a state. Even if you remove this type of state that we have today, a new type will spring up to ensure that the ruling class remains in power because it's in their best interest. Capitalism will create a new state even if you remove the one it already has. Saying the same things three times is not evidence. Secondly is welfare. Now welfare is important for one main reason. When you have unemployed people, welfare prevents them from revolting. That's called a hostage situation. Now I know ANCAPs think unemployment wouldn't be a problem. But can you honestly say that would at be all times 0%? As far as I can tell, only Keynesians think that 0% unemployment is desirable. The reason that it's as high today is because of statism, 
but there are plenty of reasons why people can be unemployed. They Maybe they're between jobs, having quit one and will start a new one in two weeks. Maybe they're retiring. What kind of moral busybody are you to say that what people do with their time is your business, and how conceited are you to assume it should be any of mine? No, it won't always be 0%, but who cares? Because here you have two options. You can say there will be some unemployment, in which case these people are going to get desperate due to the lack of food, and eventually you know, be more likely to rise up and try and overthrow the capitalist state. I would imagine that in your worldview, it's in the evil ruling class's interests to keep workers starving, so they aren't physically strong enough to rise up. Even so, you can't just state something as fact without explaining yourself. I'm not sure how it is that the agricultural revolution, which made food cheaper and easier to get for the average person, was actually a ransom being paid to workers to get them to not revolt. But you don't explain anything to me. Or if you say it would be 0%, shows again how little you actually know about your own ideology. I know unemployment wouldn't be at 0%. Don't tell me what I believe. Unemployment is something that the capitalists utilize to make profit. So if there is no unemployment, unemployment would be artificially created. What the f- <laughs> What the- I, Oh, okay, I'll admit, that's a new one. Now, I might be wrong, but I think I see where this is going. Unemployment creates competition among workers, driving labor prices down, and allowing business owners to hire them for cheaper. Let's see what he's got. Unemployment is useful because it forces the working class to compete among themselves for lower wages to get jobs, especially when there's no minimum wage installed. If someone is starving to death, they're going to be willing to work for any price that will put food on their table or their family. This means they're likely to be willing to work for a lower price than someone who's already employed. So this pre-existing worker has to be able to work for less or be replaced by the more desperate worker. How did I know? What's interesting is that he acknowledges market forces when it comes to driving down prices for certain commodities like labor, but he can't seem to bring himself to apply that logic to every market transaction. Nonetheless, the argument is contradictory with labor theory of value in worker exploitation. If business owners have so much power that they can just arbitrarily set the wages of their workers, then market forces driving down wages should be a non-issue. And even if it were an issue, that unemployment would not be in the owner's best interests, as it means they have to arbitrarily reduce the amount of surplus labor they can extract from their smaller workforce. By their own logic, this theory regarding unemployment makes no sense whatsoever. It's not even getting into how minimum wage was established specifically to keep blacks from working on the railroads in 1908 because they were outbidding the white workers. So you can't praise minimum wage for helping workers when it also causes the unemployment you see as an issue. Minimum wage creates a price floor, which necessarily results in surplus supply, which is how it creates unemployment. It's basic economics. Now, I am aware that this can work in the opposite way too. Different employers would have to increase their wages in order to compete for a workforce. However, this just again shows why unemployment is useful for the capitalists. No. It shows that you acknowledge the efficacy of market forces, but refuse to take it to its logical conclusion. Let's skip over a bit since he just repeats himself. So you see, Ancaps, don't hate the state and all the free money it gives out to everybody all the time. It's only there to help your beloved job creators at the end of the day. You're right. The state is there to help businesses, but only certain kinds of businesses. And you're completely ignoring the main reason why Ancaps hate the state. The state is completely immoral. It steals from us to fund a war against its own people for smoking plants and to destabilize parts of the world to prop up a worthless currency, killing hundreds of thousands and leaving thousands more to be literally enslaved. You know, it's kind of important. Really, you've constructed a straw man of anarcho-capitalism, one which embraces supply-side economics and just general neoconservatism. Truth is... And caps hate corporate welfare and corporatism too. They just know that forcing businesses to act according to, say, our preferences, back with government violence, is not the best or even an ethical way to do so. Framing your opponents through the lens of Hegelian dialectics 
makes all their positions the exact opposite of yours. In this case, because anarcho-capitalists don't want a worker state, they must want a corporate state, right? Drop the dialectics, because otherwise you can't have a discussion and you're deliberately misleading your audience. I get that a lot of ANCAPs and libertarians don't like the state, not because they feel it uh, hinders corporations or leads to monopolies, but simply because they feel that any service carried out by the state is always going to be less efficient than if it were carried out privately. And I can see where they get this from. I'm the question of whether or not it's more efficient to have workers or slaves pick cotton is immaterial to the fact that slavery is freaking immoral. The state is freaking immoral. Taxation is theft doesn't matter what tricks of language you try to use to dance around it. Property being taken from someone else without their permission, that's theft. And taxation is an intrinsic part of the state. If the state under capitalism is not open to direct democracy, and is instead a bureaucratic fest, when there's no competition involved, it's obviously much likely to have a lower quality of services. However, a worker state on the other hand is different. That's wishful thinking. And you haven't explained yourself once this entire video, so I have no need to address it. For the sake of my audience, however, I will do so. That there is no competition in statism is a feature of the state, as it is a monopoly on arbitration that gives itself a monopoly on legitimized violence. Whether or not it is autocratic or direct democratic is completely irrelevant. If there were competition, then there can't be a state since nobody in the right mind would voluntarily associate with an organization that steals their money and restricts their ability to make that money in the first place. The fact that it's directly democratic changes nothing. It simply institutionalizes the appeal to the crowd logical fallacy. Demagogues throughout history have manipulated mob mentalities to their advantage, and that's not going to change. You're only going to give them more power. This is something you don't get in a state today, or in even private companies. It's because of this, and how it's in the best interest of everyone that the services that the state provides are working as best as possible, that, the, that they're going to be functioning better under socialism. This isn't an academic question. Socialism has been tried in dozens of countries. Where has this ever happened where socialism has worked out for the better? What about where a government service has been more efficient than the private sector? not even mentioning socialism, and if not, why didn't they work? And how does your personal ideal of what socialism entails avoid the pitfalls of what caused these socialist experiments to become failed states? And no, saying that you won't be infested by the CIA is not a reason. But he's not going to explain himself. No, he's just going to drum up some old Marxist cliches and move the goalposts faster than Brett Kavanaugh's accusers. Someone's going to watch this video three months from now and think, which NFL team is Brett Kavanaugh quarterback for again? Anyways, it's the same old cliche over and over again. You don't want workers to be in control of everything? That means you want corporations to be in control of everything. Ugh. You have to admire their persistence nonetheless, advocating for an idea that, should it reach its conclusion, will result in your enslavement. A worker state will develop a central bank to fund itself which will indebt the state to large financial interests. I mean, it's no coincidence that Karl Marx was third cousin to a Rothschild, and a Rothschild employee. You know the Rothschilds, right? The family that owns and controls many of the central banks throughout the world? Yeah, Marx was an employee of theirs. Since the state's continued existence will be in the financial interest of the central bank, it won't be allowed to <laughs> fade away and it will simply become more authoritarian as time goes on, as its population grows and the state needs to cannibalize more of the economy, if only to prevent crime. Of course, the worker state is already extremely authoritarian. If it is empowered to dissolve property rights arbitrarily, then there's nothing it can't do to you. In a way, we're fighting for our lives. I know I'd be executed for counter-revolutionary thought crimes, but the thing is, I don't think I can justify debating Marxists anymore. It's just boring. I'm bored. Zeg 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 z. You're, you're boring me. You can't even come up with an original way to strawman your opponents. I could be doing literally anything else. The only reason I'm here 
is because this kind of propaganda is too dangerous to be left alone. Questions? Comments? Critique? Is Marxism worthwhile? How would you fare under Marxism? Leave a comment below. Support me on Patreon. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.